Good morning, everyone. I'm Hilary Stupa with QDAVR Software, and today's webinar is going to be on creating forms that move easily between site collections. So the reason this came about as a webinar topic is because we're currently working on a rather large project that involves a lot of forms. I mean, I'm talking maybe a 12 or 13 form solution, and it has a lot of moving parts. Um, we realized we were starting brand new. It wasn't like this was something in production that we were working with or anything else. And, and we realized a couple weeks ago that part of this solution was about ready to go live. I mean, with 12 forms, you know, it's, it's not like everything is necessarily going to go live at the same time. There's, there's certain parts of the process that you can start using a little earlier. And we thought, hmm, okay, they're going to go live. We have to set up a dev environment, so we've got a place to continue working and to fix bugs. Um, the, the issue we had was there wasn't budget or time to actually run off and create a whole new server for this. Obviously, it would be a lovely thing if every project um, had the capacity to have multiple servers, right, so things truly are completely separated. This was not one of those cases. Everything was going to have to live on the same server. This particular solution also involves DBXL, but it involves SharePoint. Um, and databases and things of that nature. So we've got everything is going to live on the same server, but we need to be able to keep doing development work while our client starts moving things into production. To top it all off, these forms are relying on a REST web service, and this REST web service is not something we've created or administered, but it's something the client's IT department has control over. And the REST web service had been pointing to a test database and was going to get pointed to a production database. Uh, they were happy to stand up a test instance for us um, so that they had a test and dev, or I mean, I'm sorry, a dev and production instance. But the fact remained that we needed to make sure that our development work was using the correct instance of this web service and our production work was using the correct instance of this web service. To top it all off, of course, as we go along and make bug fixes, we need a safe environment to deploy those and to have the client test them so that the client can approve them before we move them into production. So that's where we stood. That was, that's, my, that's my long backstory. story, is, is we were just in one of those situations you end up in. You're motoring along on a project, you're motoring along on your project, and all of a sudden you're like, hmm, some of this is going live and some of it's not. Some of it's going to be pointed to production and some of it shouldn't be. Now what? Right, and we came up with a methodology. Um, Jimmy Rich was was instrumental in talking through this with me, um, and we came up with a methodology that that simplified the process for us. There's some um, a little bit of heavy lifting up front when you get everything set up, but at this point with these forms, even with this kind of you know maybe a little scary stuffs on the same server, uh, we've got things set up so. All I have to do is publish the forms under a different name and uh, just upload them to the admin deployment, to central admin, and, and move on along my way. And I wanted to share it with you guys because I know we're not the only people out there who have to worry about moves between uh, dev and production. And I just want you to have this, uh, some of these techniques to think about. Okay, so I mean, obviously, why set up a dev environment? Well, once it's in production, it's hard to test changes and debug. We've we've all done the the hidden view with the magic hidden button so that we can click into a view the user can't easily find, so we can see stuff behind the scenes and figure out why things are going wrong. Right? I know we have, um, or we've published something with with like debug information on the forum itself and said, oh, just ignore that for right now. <laughs> It'll go away soon. So by having dedicated environments, you can make the debugging and the unit testing less nerve-wracking. Um, and again, if you can have completely separate servers, that's fantastic. But if you can't, some of these tips may help you. And this is an actual picture of me deploying a changed form to production. I am uh, attend, I tend to be kind of high strung and I do get worried about breaking something that's in production. It makes me really nervous. So one way to do this is the hard way. Um, 
and and I confess that I first started out on this path the hard way. I was thinking I would have to manually redirect my data connections and go update them prior to publishing. I hope I didn't miss any. Uh, republish and then and then go make sure that all of the, you know, because we're using DBXL in these and they've got a lot of queries in them and those queries indicate a database. So now I've got to go make sure that all of my query XML strings are pointed to the correct database and I have to make sure that my DBXL document types are, my, my documents are submitting to the right document type. Um, and to top it all off, we had this REST issue. I have to make sure I'm querying the correct server so that I'm not making changes to their production uh, database, right? So all of these things have to be managed and, and you manage these things every time you publish the form. So that means if I have a bad day, or I wake up tired, or I'm out sick and somebody else publishes the form, there's a lot of complexity here now that, that we have to have more than one person understand, right? Um, I had initially started thinking, well, I'll just add some rules to this form on, on finished loading and queue rules, and I'll just use queue rules to change some of these things. And then, like I said, I walked through it with Jimmy, and, and he had some other suggestions that I feel in the end uh, gave us an easily, um, an easily movable form, and it makes me really happy every time I publish these now, which is not what I expected to be saying. So this option two, I call it the easy way. Um, we're using UDCX connections for almost everything. Um, in these forms, we're not doing any SharePoint list queries, uh, but if we, oh, I am doing one, sorry, <laughs> digress. Um, but if we, you know, with SharePoint list queries, uh, with, with what I'm going to show you, those continue to just to just work. Um, but we're using relative UDCXs for everything else, including our SharePoint library submits. Um, we're also using a UDCX to a specific XML file. We have a copy on each site collection in, in, in the documents library. Actually, I've put it in another library and kind of hidden it. But, um, and that has some information that I'm leveraging in form logic, like the name of the database I want for my QueryDB queries or uh, the correct URL for my REST data connections for, for uh, form rules that change that. Um, and, and so I can put some site-specific information in these configuration files, and since I'm using a relative UDCX, the form's going to use the config file from its site. Okay? Um, when, you know, if I had this to do over again, my first site that I created that we started working from would have been my dev site, and then I would have copied that site collection uh, to make that into my production site. The URL we used for our initial work was the one the client wants in production, so I ended up doing this a little backwards. Next time I'll assume my initial site is my dev site, so learn from my mistakes. And um, I'm using uh, the SharePoint management shell, um, and copy SP site. I'm going to show you how to do that because it's super fantastic if you're doing uh, dev work or you're doing demos and you need to quickly pop up a site, all of these things. And um, the management shell can be, I think, a little intimidating if you're used to using UI tools. Um, and and it is going to save you so much time in your life that it is worth, worth lear learning about. The first time, you know, when you get things set up and you copy your site, you're going to have to clean up your UDCX files. If in the course of your development you create additional data connections, you're going to have to remember to put them on both sites. Okay, so there's no magic there. It's just a matter of a little discipline on that. And and again, we've got a little more uh, a little more setup here, but. Uh, when you go and you, you, you take your newly uh, updated form from dev and you have to publish it to production and all you have to do is, you know, publish it to a different site or publish it under a name, a different name, this, this setup is going to make you super happy that you've done the work. Um, so if it's admin deployed and everything's on the same server, in this case our forms are admin deployed and everything's on the same server, I had to have different names for my templates because, you know, let's say example template name is search. I can only have one search.xsn admin deployed on my, on my server. So I have one called search and one called search-dev and that's what I'm talking about when I say I just publish it under a different name. I've got search activated to my production. Uh, site collection. I've got search-dev activated to my 
development site collection. So I publish it as search or search-dev, and then I just upload it uh, back to central admin. Um, and, and I've done the same thing in DBXL in this particular instance. So if you are a DBXL user, um, I use the migration tool. I exported all my stuff, made some minor modifications, and re-imported it under uh, new document type names. And, and all of those two dash dev is, is part of the name. And then in my configuration file, I, I leverage that in my form logic. So I'm going to pop over to a little bit of a demo now and kind of show you some of the things I'm talking about. Um, this, you know, this is kind of a, a just sort of a, a quick and dirty. Want to get your your minds moving in this direction, so you think about this with your next with your next large solution or with your next thing that you you know that <laughs> because you know the person who asked you for the form, you know that they're going to want iterations and changes and all of these things. Um, any of those those things, it's really nice to have a place where you can develop safely, test safely get client approval and whether your clients internal or external and then and then publish your production form so I've got my site set up it's just a simple little site and on my site I have a configuration file here in my documents and that configuration file is um, just a super uh, simple little XML sure let's save it and I'm just going to pop it open here in uh, Notepad++. Plus plus. Uh, it's just a super simple little XML file. Um, I've got a, a database uh, uh, field in there, and that's because I'm using QueryDB, and I want to use a different alias depending on my uh, deployment. Uh, I've got a, a REST URL. This is just a SharePoint one. I was just kind of making stuff up. And then, you know, I'd mentioned that my, my document types I, in DBXL, I, I'm using dash dev. So I've got this document type. Uh, name suffix. My form itself, let me just find that. I didn't have it open, sorry about that. Uh, my form itself is a super duper simple form. Um, it's got a few data connections in it. Uh, one is to directly to a SharePoint list. You can see this is on HJS1. One is to the configuration form. Again, you can see the connection sources, HJS1, and one is my main submit. And you can see that's also a UDCX. So one of the reasons that I wish we had started with our dev site and then, and then uh, cloned that to create our production site is because I needed to go through all of these forms and make sure that their UDCX connections were pointed to the dev site so that when we were doing development work on the forms and we hit the preview button, they would go get their data connections from the dev site. Um, it, again, it wasn't the end of the world. I went through the, the manifest files and used find and replace. <laughs> but um, if you start out with your dev site and then create your production site, you can spare yourself that little bit of that little bit of angst. Um, so I'm going to pop open my, I've got a little, um, sheet here that I need to copy and I'm not doing very well with that. Sorry about all the flickering about. Um, I'm going to just close this presentation so I can pop it open and get my notes. Sorry, I'm probably giving you guys vertigo. I, I just had, had uh, put down um, the syntax for copy site. So I'm going to pop open a new little guy here. So this is uh, the syntax for the PowerShell copy site command. Um, this is my original site, HJS1. This is the site collection I'm going to create, HJS3. Okay? And what this will do is this will create a brand new site collection for me um, with everything that's currently in HJS1. And so you can see right now we've got HJS3 here. It's, it's, it doesn't exist yet. Um, so if I pop over here to my server, let me pop that down, and go to the management shell, I'm going to run it as admin. Okay, and yeah, this does require you have you know server access, SharePoint server access, or um, take your server admin cookies or iced tea or whatever her preference is, right? To to have them do this. I'm just going to stretch this out a little so you can see it. Okay, or not, you know. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so all I have to do here is take this and I'm going to hit enter. 
Um, this is quick. One of the things I have found about this that I really like is that it maintains the, the GUIDs for the lists and libraries as well. So your GUIDs for your lists and libraries are the same on your new site collection. If you're doing anything that's depending on those, um, that, can be, uh, that can be kind of a nice trick there as well. So I'm going to refresh this guy. And while he's refreshing, we're going to pop back over here. I've got a list here, and I just want to show you the stuff that's in it, item 1, 2, and 3. And um, here, HJS3, you can see the, the, the title stayed the same, right? But the URL now is HJS3, so you could clean that up, obviously. Um, and my test list still has all my test stuff in it. So if we pop over here to my form and open it, and I just want to show you the, the, how, changes, um, how changes do show up here. So you can see we've got item 1, 2, and 3 here in our test form. And if I open up this guy, um, we would also have item 1, 2, and 3, right? Because our list uh, has 1, 2, and 3 in it. But just on the off chance, um, there we go. So here's our item 1, 2, and 3. But just to kind of verify that that things are indeed talking to the correct site, right? We can edit this and and call it test, and we'll edit another one too. Because to me, you know, when I look at the InfoPath form, even though it tells me that those data connections are relative, um, I have doubt, right? I have to I have to see it for myself, right? And so now I can see that this is indeed getting information from this list, right? So the next things I need to do is I need to address my data connections. And and this is when I'm talking about you've got a little work up front. These are the things I'm talking about. You know, you've got to you've got to clean these up because these aren't going to magically get updated. They're still pointing to the original site. So I'll just save and we're going to take this one too and save. They're very easy um, to change if you haven't looked at a, at a UDX file before. Um, you know, don't don't be intimidated by them. They're, they're, they're easy peasy. So I'm going to open up this one first. This is my config. If you're not using um, Notepad++ yet, I know I, I know I <laughs> preach about it a lot. I encourage you to. I encourage you to uh, add the XML plugins because then it's really, you know, easy to read. So I just changed that site um, so that it's querying uh, HJS3 and I'm going to save it and then I'm going to change the other one, my submit connection. So again, it's you know you've got this little bit of this little bit of setup that you've got to do, and I'm going to change the language on this the the language on this again so you can see more easily the Excel. It's so much easier not to um, not to fat finger things if you've got the syntax highlighting. I think maybe everybody else doesn't have that struggle that I do. Um, so I'm going to upload these guys back here, quick and easy, and pop you in place. Yeah, replace it. I'm not kidding around, folks. And let's drop this guy and replace it. Okay, so now my form here, my submit connection's been updated, and he, this form is going to submit to his library. Okay, so you can see you've got that little extra bit of work. Go fix up your UDCXs, make sure they're pointed in the right direction. But at this point now, when I change my form template itself, I can just publish it. This one's published to a library. It's not admin deployed. But I can just publish it directly to whichever library um, I want to. So if my HJS1 is my dev site, I make my form changes. I publish it to HJS1. Um, and the user can or the client can go take a look. They can approve those changes. I take that exact same template that I just published to HJS1, I publish it over to uh, HJS3, and, and we're in business. Um, you can see here we've got this config information. If I changed this in, in this site, um, and we're just going to do that real quick for giggles. Right? Uh, come on, be sweet. And I'm going to open the folder. And one second, pop this guy open. 
actually I'm just going to use the same one and be lazy, but you can see I could remove, for example, that from my database or in my form logic I'm setting my doc type name um, and I'm including this suffix so if it's blank nothing gets added. You know I could say well my rest URL is actually like this now here and you save everything and you drag it over, you throw it over here, replace it. Okay so now I've got a separate configuration file on each on each site. If I open up my my form here on my clone site, you can see I've got nothing here. I've got this new URL here. Um, and, and not all of these pieces are going to be valid for any one of your solutions necessarily, but some of the pieces may be. And using this approach allowed me to take the information from the config XML data source and info path and set a few fields values that I could then leverage throughout the form. And it allowed me to now not have to uh, not have to think about it when I publish. Like I said, all I have to do is publish as dash dev first, uh, admin approve it, and then once the client says go, I publish it as the regular form and I, I admin approve it. Um, so kind of kind of quick, not a lot to not a lot more to show here. Um, I just wanted to get you thinking about how uh, UDCX data connections. Um, can be helpful to you and the different ways they can be. This idea of having a separate config XML on either site with a UDCX pointed to it really hadn't occurred to me until Jimmy brought it up and it, it simplified things immeasurably. Um, having UDCX for my SharePoint submits means I don't have to go change the submit URL in the form when I move it from one place to another. I don't have to have a rule that changes it. Um, I just am using form logic all the way through. And I thought, well, it simplified things so much for me that it would be nice to uh, it would be nice to go ahead and, and simplify it for you as well if, if if this was something that was applicable in your environment. And I think for, for most of us it is. Um, so if anybody has uh, any questions, feel free to toss them into chat. Um, I suppose I should like, be all classy here and put this back in, in presentation mode, right? And um, do feel free to, to chat any questions. Uh, as always, you can um, email me questions as well. Um, <laughs> we can blast through these again. I'm so good with PowerPoint, aren't I? Uh, feel free to email me questions as well. It's hillary.stupa at qdabber.com. Uh, fill out our survey and we've got a little sample form for you. You guys saw it. It wasn't a lot of hot shakes, but um, it should at least kind of give you the idea of what we've got going on here. Um, and feel free to check out this recording and all of our others on, on YouTube. And do I need the config XML file if I'm not using DBXL? Well, it really just depends on, on what, what kind of form logic you've got. Like, for example, are you using REST connections and there's a production and a development server, right? In that case, you might need to use a config XML. The, the, the point was that, that there may be some things that are specific to production and dev. One thing I've done in one of our forms is, you know, there was that, that doc type name suffix I actually leveraged that for showing a banner across the top of the form, letting the user know they're in the dev environment, right? So I'm like, well, if doc type suffix is equal to dev, then display this expression box that says, this is the development environment of blah, blah, blah. Data saved here will not go to blah, blah, blah. So even for that, even for that benefit, having that little config XML file is kind of nice because I don't have somebody coming to me and saying, well, I, I didn't know I was in the dev environment, right? So you can use it for things like that as well. Um, but no, I mean, unless you've got uh, something data connection wise or query wise or or something like that 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 changes between the two between dev and production and that you are using formulas to set and so on it's just a convenient place to store uh, some form logic style values that you may need and and it really does depend on your form itself its complexity and its logic I, I hope that I hope that answered that um, so if there are no other questions, I will go ahead and let everybody get back to their busy days. Um, we've got, uh, you guys know where to find us, uh, we've got the website, we've got YouTube, we've got um, all kinds of things, and I 
failed to update the upcoming webinar slide, so I'm not going to show you that one, um, but do check out the, the QDABRA site for upcoming webinars. Get registered for the ones that interest you, and thanks so much for attending today. I hope everybody has a great day.